Good morning, church. Today is Good Friday, the day where we celebrate and we remember what Jesus gave for us, that we might be forgiven, that we might be restored, that we might be able to have fellowship with the Father. Normally, if you were here with us on a Good Friday morning in person, we would celebrate together the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, where we would remember this very act that Jesus gave for us. But we're not together physically, but we are together. And yet this table is going to stand open and, and, and on display for all of us to see and remember. We're going to leave the table set up until we're able to meet again. Because we want us to not only remember, but we also want to give something for us to look forward to. That when this crisis is all over and we're able to gather together for worship, we're going to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate together the faith that we profess. And this morning, we're going to do that. We're going to remember that faith that we profess as we walk into the story of Good Friday. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give thanks that as you were going to be betrayed, that as you were with your disciples in that upper room, you took bread and you gave thanks. And after you gave thanks, you told them to do this in remembrance of you. And Lord, we thank you that out of your great love, you followed the path that was set before you. And that you came, that you were isolated, rejected, abandoned, so that we might be made right with you, that we might be forgiven, that we might be able to know a, a joy that rests in all circumstances, and that we'd be able to discover what it really means to be alive. And so we come this morning on this Good Friday, asking you to breathe once again those words of grace and of life into our story. That we might be able to not only walk, but to run in faith and in hope because of your amazing love for us. In your name we pray. People of God, our loving Savior Jesus came into the world for you. And as you gather on this Good Friday morning, may his grace, may his mercy, and may his peace rest and abide in you. Amen. Good morning, church. Join us as we sing our first song. Behold the Lamb. Oh uh -huh. 
oh my people, oh my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for your savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through times of persecution and of renewal and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I made you branches of my vineyard and gave you the water of salvation. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar and gall and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, but you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I brought you to the land of freedom and prosperity, but you have scorched, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a servant. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I accepted the cup of suffering and death for your sakes, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to lead you but you close your hearts to guidance. I called you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I prayed that you all may be one, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen people, Israel, but you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you join heirs with them in my covenants, but you made them scapegoats of your own guilt. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, but you gave me no food. Thirsty, but you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. Naked, but you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, but you did not visit me. Lord, Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Christ, have, have mercy.
but God of Calvary.
you have a Bible with yourself this morning, I encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 32. That's Matthew 27, beginning in verse 32. The text reads, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the charge which was written against him. This is the king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heap insults on him. It's Good Friday. We walk through the last week of Jesus' life and our moments often turn to that time where Jesus turned over the tables, where he would be arrested, where there would be a trial, well, if you can even call it a trial, and where he would be sentenced to death. We think about all of those moments leading up to today. We think of the story where, where Jesus goes to the cross and, and he gives his life for you and I that we might have it, have it abundantly. But I want you to think about Good Friday a little differently this morning. I want you to hold on to that story. But as you walk into that story, as you walk into the text from Matthew 27, I want you to look at the story this morning, possibly from the story of Jesus. What it was like to be isolated, abandoned, alone, rejected. Because that's in fact what happens, not only from mankind, but from his father. Here's why I think that. In John chapter 10, we read these words, beginning in verse 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, the Jews replied, but for blasphemy. Because you are a mere man who claims to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, what about the very one whom the Father has set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father says. But if I do, and even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I and am the Father. What profound words that Jesus is laying out for you and I this morning. Because you remember in John 1, John 1 verse 1, which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and He was with God in the beginning. In other words, there wasn't a moment 
that the Father and the Son were not together. Doesn't that draw you to Philippians chapter 2? In Philippians chapter 2, we read those words, He who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He humbled himself. And picture this, is he humbled himself and he left the throne room of heaven. He left the side of his Father for you and I. Not only did he leave the throne room of his Father, but he did so to become a servant. Not only did he do so to become a servant, but he did so to give himself as a sacrifice for you and I, that we may be made right, that we might know God. Good Friday invites us into the story and the curiosity of what it means to be isolated, isolated abandoned, and alone. And we think of our own stories where that very thing happens. Our worship team is going to share two of those moments of isolation. I think right now we all know a thing or two about isolation, but I don't want to talk about uh, what I am going through right now, but take you back to a moment in my life where I felt isolated. Um, it was supposed to be a happy moment. Um, this was uh, now almost 19 years ago. Franz and I moved to the United States and we moved there because he, uh, he had a job offer there and we saw it as a big uh, adventure and opportunity and uh, uh, we really wanted to go there and, and try it out. And um, when we moved, um, we um, we, we came to Atlanta and we'd never been there. We only had four suitcases. We had nothing, only each other. And that was great that we had each other, but um, we were living in a hotel for the first couple of weeks, trying to find an apartment. And um, after two days, Franz had to go to work. And um, uh, he was excited, he was happy to go to work, but I was by myself. I had no car yet. Um, Atlanta is not really set up for uh, public transit, so I was stuck in a hotel and I was lonely. I was just by myself and counting out the hours, counting down the hours until he came back to the hotel again because I felt lonely and thought, now what? What do I do? I'm just here by myself. I know nobody. I cannot talk to anybody. I have no phone, I have nothing. And uh, that for me was a true uh, moment of uh, isolation where I really had to think, what do I do now? I feel lonely, I feel um, just um, sad. And I'm supposed to be happy because I'm here uh, on an adventure but I don't feel that way. I actually felt a little depressed after a couple of weeks. So that was my moment of isolation. So for me, uh, <clears throat> uh, my moment of isolation uh, is probably what we're going through right now because I've never been in a situation like this before, nothing even close to it. Um, and it's really hard because uh, well, the hardest part for me is not being able to see my friends and talk to them because it's already, it's been like a month now already, so uh, it's been a very long time. And um, uh, another hard thing is just having a schedule and being able to go through the day knowing like what to do because right now it's very hard to, um, to find stuff to do and uh, luckily, school is starting up a, a bit again, but uh, yeah, it's definitely very hard. I want you to magnify what Sam and Marlene have just shared by a thousand. You have never been separated from your father. 
You've known the joy and the intimacy of his presence all of the time. But now as we make our way to the cross, we hear Jesus saying these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a cry of anguish from the deepest part of Jesus' being. It is a part of excruciating pain. For not only knowing the absence of what will be the Father, But for what is to come. You see, those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are words the Jewish people knew. They're from Psalm 22, Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, where the psalmist writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night. I find no rest. They sang, they read, they memorized those words. They understood exactly what Jesus was trying to say in those moments. Can you picture for a moment the anguish of Jesus in that moment? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a cry of what is to come. But how? How is it even possible? How could it happen? How could God the Father tear himself from the Son? How could the Father leave this intimate relationship with his son and leave him alone and isolated and abandoned and alone. It really begs the question, doesn't it? What is it that Jesus can't stand or God the Father can't stand? What is it that has no place in his presence? What is it that separates us from the Father? And the answer is sin. Why is it that he needed to be isolated and abandoned and alone? Because the scriptures tell us that he became our substitute. That is, he took our place. That is, he took on the wrath and the guilt and everything you have ever done unto himself. And because God, the Father, can't stand sin, his Son, who became sin, would be need to be cast out of his presence and rejected and abandoned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a cry of spiritual desolation. And for three long hours, we see that torment within our Savior. I can't help but think of the pain, not only for the Father, but also the Son. Because even while Jesus was there on the cross, even while he was doing this for us, his desire was always the Father. His desire was always to be one with the Father. His desire was always about fellowship with the Father. That's why he cries out, My God, my God! Why have you forsaken me? Because he wanted his Father. He missed his Father. And so there we gather at the foot of the cross with a Messiah who was isolated. Abandoned, alone, rejected for us. Gave up everything so that we might know the joy of forgiveness. Think about it for a moment. 
of what it's like to no longer be alone, to no longer be separated, to no longer be abandoned. Because that's what Jesus does for us. And we have those moments in our story where isolation gets lifted. For me, that moment when the isolation got lifted was when, um, well, first of all, we got a car. So I was able to go out by myself and just explore where we actually moved to. But the main thing was uh, when really the isolation wasn't there anymore, when uh, we were searching for an apartment and uh, um, somebody who was showing us the apartment, she was um, a girl the same age as me and she was from South Africa. And um, she um, just a couple years before moved to the United States for college actually. But um, she said, I know what it's like to be totally by yourself, knowing nobody, uh, would you go and have lunch with me one day? And uh, I thought, wow, that's amazing. So yes, I, I, uh, I, I called her and we, uh, we had lunch, uh, I had lunch with her and we actually became uh, really good friends. And um, because of that, we realized we do need people here, here. So we do need friends. And, one place where we can find like-minded people and friends is if we find a church. So that weekend, we, uh, we uh, looked up some churches and actually found a CRC in Atlanta and uh, uh, went there. And uh, uh, that's where we really got to know uh, like-minded people, people with the same values. And uh, we understood that that was very important in our lives. So, um, we were no longer alone, and I was no longer alone. And, uh, that was just a, a, an awesome feeling, and we had great years there. Um, for me, well, like the isolation is still going on, but um, there are moments where I don't feel alone anymore because because of all the technology we have. Uh, we were able to do a Zoom call with the Insight people. Um, and I'm able to still keep in touch with all my friends on uh, social media and stuff like that. So uh, in that way, uh, at those points, I do feel the isolation being broken. And the story of Good Friday is that we don't need to be alone. We don't need to be isolated. We don't need to be abandoned by God. Because the story of Good Friday is of God's amazing love for you and for me. And that he willingly gave up his life that we might be able to have a relationship with the Father. That you might be able to be forgiven. That you might be able to know joy even in the midst of still being in isolation. That you would be able to have peace with God. To enjoy the riches of heaven. To be restored like the prodigal sons who, who come to the Father. And one comes and he says, Father, forgive me. You see, Good Friday is the invitation for you and I to come again in our story. Claiming our need for a Savior. And being able to rise in the midst of the Good Friday story. And live in joy. We're not there yet. I know it's Friday, but, but Sunday's coming, and the, the exciting part of the rest of the story is the Son gets to go to be back with the Father. The Son is going to, to rise again from the dead. The Son is going to ascend to the Father. The Son, who there now is sitting at the right hand of his Father, being restored fully with his father. I don't know what the Good Friday story does for you. But for me, it reminds me that I'll never be alone again. And what a wonderful grace you and I have been given. What a story we have to tell. Whether we make a phone call, 
whether we Zoom, whether we use Facebook, to tell the story today of a Savior who could change the life of the person next to you. Because he so loved you that he was willing to be isolated, abandoned, and rejected by his Father so that you and I could know him. Our prayer is that you will come to know that joy. Our prayer as community churches, if you don't have a church home, maybe you're watching for the very first time, that you'd be able to find the church home. And we'd love to have you to continue to join us, to walk in the story of grace. Would you pray with me? I can't even imagine Oh God, what it was like to know that you willingly and purposefully and intentionally would send your son to die for us. And that your son would purposefully and willingly follow that plan. And that together, knowing that there would be isolation and abandonment, you purposefully and intentionally did so <clears throat> for us. And Lord, on this Good Friday, we give you thanks for what you have done for us in Christ. And because of that, that we don't never, that we never alone need to be alone or feel abandoned rejected. Because you showed us what it means to be loved. And so in the midst of our stories this morning, Lord, maybe we don't know you, but today is a day to come to the foot of the cross. Maybe this morning we're wrestling with our faith, trying to intellectually make sense, Lord, that this morning you are calling us to the foot of the cross to believe by faith. Maybe this morning we're wrestling with that real feeling of isolation, because we are in isolation. That our spirits may perk up this morning because you hold us in the palm of your hands. And Lord, may we never forget your amazing love for us. Thank you. Let's worship and sing, lead me to the cross.
We are thankful that you're able to join us this morning for our Good Friday service, and we invite you to join us on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for Easter Sunday, where we look at Easter. It's not what we expected. We'll be worshiping Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, and we hope that you can join us for that. But until we meet at that point, know that you are forgiven, that you are loved by God, and that Jesus gave his life for you. And after our closing lesson, we will have a song, and then we look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. People of God, as you rest in the story of the one who was isolated, abandoned, and rejected for you. May the love of God fill you. May it strengthen you. May it sustain you. May it uphold you. As together we walk on this journey of faith. And may your spirit refresh us and sustain us. In your name we pray.
Namaste.